It's time to talk about June's Journey, a hidden object mystery game with a captivating detective story. When you're playing, you solve a mind-teasing mystery of the roaring 1920s while you dive into June's captivating quest to uncover a scandalous family secret and solve her sister's murder. It's mystery, it's danger, and it's romance, and you never know where the next chapter's gonna take you. If that wasn't fun enough, you get to customize your very own luxurious island estate. Seriously, I cannot stop playing. I am already on the third chapter, and I just started recently. Join me back in time in the glamorous 1920s. June needs your help, detective. Download June's Journey for free today on iOS and Android. You know the drill. Patrons heard this episode first. It's easy to join. Just visit the link in our show notes or visit patreon.com slash the murder diaries pod. Another fun perk patrons get is a shout out in an episode. Speaking of, thanks so much, Erica and Laura. Welcome back to another episode of The Murder Diaries. I'm Paige. And I'm Natalie. In April 2011, a French businessman named Xavier Dupont de Ligonnès and his family vanished from their home in Nantes, France, leaving no trace. Agnès, his wife, and the mother of their four children, Arthur, Thomas, Anne, and Benoit, were eventually discovered buried in their backyard, along with their two dogs. They'd been horrifically murdered. But Xavier is still missing and is considered suspect number one. This is their story. You still think it's in my head, but I'm walking with the dead. Xavier and Agnes and their four children, Arthur, Thomas, Anne, and Benoit, make up the Dupont de Ligonnès family. Agnès was well known for her warmth and kindness. She was a devoted mother to the four children and worked at a local Catholic school. Her entire life revolved around the family. She always prioritized their needs. The eldest child, Arthur, was a bright and ambitious young man attending a technical school. He was enthusiastic about computers and technology and hoped to pursue a career in the field. Thomas, the second oldest, was a talented musician who loved music and played the guitar. He was also a student and really close with his siblings. Anne, the only daughter, was a creative, artistic soul who liked to paint and draw. She was well known for her gentle demeanor and her close relationship with her younger brother, Benoit. Benoit, the youngest, was inquisitive and outgoing. He enjoyed sports, particularly rugby. He had a lively personality and was adored by all who knew him. The family's two black Labradors, Jules and Leon, were your typical labs. Goofy, sweet, and dedicated to the family. Xavier was born in 1961. He was a businessman with a taste for the finer things in life, always striving to protect an image of success and sophistication. He put a lot of importance on the family's appearance and made sure to maintain the family's image in the community. Xavier was well known in this community for his charm and outgoing personality. Behind the scenes, however, he was dealing with some serious financial problems and his seemingly perfect world was on the verge of collapsing. His mental health was rapidly deteriorating, but nobody knew just how bad things had gotten inside the prison of his own mind. Agnès was born in 1969. She was eight years younger than Xavier. Again, she was devoted and a loving mother to her four children. Unfortunately, she'd been suffering from chronic fatigue syndrome and depression. Xavier actually had the audacity to complain about this to his friends from time to time. Agnès posted her concerns about her family life on the French online medical forum, Doctissimo, in 2004. She had joined the forum in order to get advice on her husband's mental health, She opened up about the difficulties she and Xavier were having in their marriage and revealed a troubling comment made by her husband. Xavier had casually mentioned to her that a large family death would not be a disaster. This disturbing statement frightened Agnès, who couldn't understand why her husband would entertain such a morbid thought. Agnès's account of this discussion on the forum provided a rare glimpse into the couple's private life, revealing a darker side in their seemingly perfect family facade. Artur, at the time of this case, was 20 years old and born in 1990. He was attending a local technical college. Artur was known as a responsible and hardworking young man who successfully balanced his studies, part-time jobs, and family life. He loved music and enjoyed playing the guitar and drums. He often played at local cafes on the weekends to earn tips. 
Next in line of the siblings is Thomas, and he was born in 1992. He was 18 at the time of the murders. He was studying music at a prestigious Catholic university in Anger, France. Thomas was dedicated to his studies and a really talented musician who could play both the piano and the cello. He was a gifted musician who enjoyed tutoring younger people. He was known to be a gentle, kind-hearted young man with a close relationship with his siblings, who missed him dearly when he was busy at university. Anne, the only daughter, was born in 1994. She was 16 years old at the time of the murders and a high school student. Friends and family regard Anne as a model Christian girl who embodied the virtues of compassion, empathy, and approachability. She was known for her warm and caring personality, not unlike her mother. This really endeared her to many people and allowed her to form long-lasting friendships. People were drawn to Anne because of her kind heart and ability to make others feel at ease in her presence. She's also described as lively and outgoing. She loved to spend time with her friends and participating in school activities. She was creative and artistic with special interest in fashion. She wanted to move to Paris to study fashion design when she was done with high school. As no surprise from what I just described about Anne, she was sociable and, again, outgoing. She really enjoyed staying in touch with her friends through a variety of means, which included online chatting, phone calls. Her friends remembered her as somebody who was always eager to catch up and share the latest news. When the murders happened and Anne was missing, this made her absence from the usual conversations all the more noticeable and concerning. When Ann went offline for that long amount of time and failed to return phone calls, her friends became increasingly concerned. This was completely out of character for Ann, who was normally very open and communicative. They had no idea that these unusual changes in her social habits would be a foreshadowing of the tragic events that were soon going to follow. Finally, the youngest sibling, Benoit, was born in 1997. Benoit was a lively teenager. He enjoyed sports particularly sailing, tennis, rugby. He was close to his older siblings and he was frequently seen playing with them or tagging along with them on their various activities. Just like his older sister, Benoit was incredibly sociable. He had a wide network of friends. In fact, his friends were one of the first people to raise the alarm when the family went missing. Now that we know a little bit more about the family, let's talk about where they lived. They lived in an exquisite, two-story house in a prosperous neighborhood of Nantes, France. In their community, they were really well-known and respected. They went to church on a regular basis and were involved in a variety of community activities. The kids went to prestigious schools, and the family appeared to live a comfortable, upper-middle-class lifestyle. These aristocratic roots of the Dupont de Lugonais family can be traced back to Annonay, a town settled within the picturesque Vivarais region of southeastern France. Their illustrious ancestors include a number of notable figures who contributed to the family's prestigious status in higher society. Edouard Dupont de Ligonnès, for example, married Sophie de Lamartine, the sister of a renowned French poet, Alphonse de Lamartine. This marriage formed an alliance with the illustrious Lamartine family, and it served to elevate the Dupont de Ligonnès name even further by uniting the two families and cementing their social standing among the aristocracy. This couple's youngest son ended up being appointed Bishop of Rodet. With that, he was a respected and influential figure within the Catholic Church. It should come at no surprise that that was also instrumental in enhancing the family's reputation and the influence in both religious and social circles. The Dupont de Ligonnès family maintained their aristocratic status from these family links. They benefited from their illustrious ancestors and the achievements of their distinguished relatives. These connections and accomplishments aided in the family's recognition and respect among the upper echelons of French society. It shaped the legacy that would later become intertwined with those tragic events. This front that the family was putting on, however, concealed the mounting financial pressures and underlying tensions. In the earlier 2000s, the Dupont de Ligonnès family actually moved to Florida. Xavier had thought it would be a great opportunity for them to find new business and achieve the American dream but it quickly turned into a nightmare. Unfortunately, Xavier's Florida business ventures were a failure. The family suffered significant financial setbacks. Xavier lost his entire life savings and his business eventually collapsed. This failure caused him a great deal of stress and shame. 
With their hopes of success in the United States dashed, the family returned to France, settling back in Nantes and acting as if nothing was wrong. However, their financial difficulties persisted. Xavier was having difficulty finding stable employment, and the family was on the verge of bankruptcy. Their home was in danger of being repossessed, and they faced the prospect of losing their comfortable lifestyle. Things were really falling apart behind the scenes. But only Xavier knew its full extent. Despite the difficulties, the Dupont de Ligonnet's family maintained their veneer of normalcy. They kept up their appearances and their social standing in the community by participating in various activities and maintaining close relationships with friends and family. They used credit cards to maintain school fees and elements of their comfortable lifestyle. The children excelled in their studies and their extracurricular activities, seemingly unaware of the family's financial situation. Soon enough, the cracks in the family's seemingly perfect life were becoming more visible. Xavier was becoming increasingly more desperate as he struggled to provide for his family. His financial situation became more dire and he became more reclusive and secretive. He began to receive letters stating that debt collectors would be visiting the house to repossess his belongings. His family was soon to be made homeless due to missed mortgage payments. As the walls closed in around him, Xavier made a decision that would change the course of the family's lives forever. These financial difficulties obviously played a huge role in the events that followed. Xavier started taking some pretty sinister actions leading up to the murders. Following his father's death in July 2010, Xavier obtained a firearms license and inherited a 22 caliber long rifle. He bought a gun silencer and started practicing at a shooting range in February of 2011. His actions became more threatening and the family's financial situation continued to deteriorate. In March of 2011, he bought some cement, a shovel, and a hoe, which was intended to be used to bury the bodies of his loved ones. At the same time, he purchased quicklime and large garbage bags to wrap the bodies in. In the days leading up to the murders, Xavier called every extended member of the family and informed them that he, his wife, and the children were being placed in the witness protection program and would thus be unreachable. Each phone call ended with the ominous words, see you soon, maybe. Xavier then began to cut all financial ties and make it nearly impossible to track him down. In another calculated move, Xavier contacted Agnes's employer and informed them that she had gastroenteritis. A few days later, the boss received a text message informing him that Agnes had been hospitalized and could not be reached by phone. A week after that, a letter allegedly written by Agnes herself arrived at her workplace, announcing her resignation and explaining that she would be following her husband to the U.S. The mailbox at the family's house had an equally foreboding message. Quote, return all mail to sender. Thank you very much. It was a straightforward directive that stated unequivocally that the family had no intention of ever returning to their home or receiving communication from the outside world for that matter. That brings us to the fateful April weekend where the four lives were taken. Arthur, the eldest child of the Dupont de Ligonnet's family, left college and failed to appear at the pizzeria where he worked on Friday, April 1st. He was supposed to collect his monthly wages on that day, and his boss was surprised by his absence. He noted that Arthur was always punctual in collecting his paycheck on the first of the month. The next day, Saturday the 2nd, a neighbor noticed Xavier loading large bags into his car, and it raised some suspicions. They seemed to have had a pleasant family night on Saturday night, but without Artur. Before going to the movies, the couple and their three children ate at a restaurant in Nantes. People who saw the family found it strange that Artur was not present. Anne and Benoit then missed school on April 4th, illness being cited as the reason for their absence. They recall hearing a rumor that the family was relocating to Australia for Zavi's job, but they found it odd that none of the Dupont de Ligonnet's family had mentioned it themselves. Friends attempted to contact Benoit and Anne via online messages and texts, but no response. Xavier himself had a 20 to 30 minute phone call with his sister Christine de Ligonnet's that same day. She later reported that during their conversation, everything seemed normal. Xavier and his son Thomas dined at a high-end restaurant later that Monday night. When they arrived around 9 p.m., Xavier ordered a half bottle of red wine and Thomas ordered a sea bass dish with a tomato juice. 
The two waiters recalled Thomas appearing gravely ill at the end of the meal, and Xavier and Thomas barely speaking to each other during their time at the restaurant. Next, on April 5th, Thomas, still alive, paid a visit to a friend. He asked to spend the night with the friend, but Xavier called and asked him to return home, claiming that his mother had been in a bike accident. Tama ate quickly with his friend before catching the train home around 10 p.m. The next day, April 6th, the friend attempted to contact Tama, but received only short messages such as, I'm not coming over. I'm sick. His friend noticed that Tama's writing style was, quote, unusual for him. Two days later, Tama's friend received the following text message from Tama. Quote, I'm out of battery. My dad is looking for a new charger for me. This is the last time Tama was heard from. It should also be noted that Agnes was seen at a hair salon near the family's home on Tuesday, April 5th. A hair salon employee is quoted saying, I went to collect my wages. It was Tuesday, April 5th. I needed to get paid. I saw her on the sidewalk talking on her phone around 12.15 or 12.30 p.m. She looked distressed. Agnes then seemingly went home. Nobody knows exactly what happened in that house except for Xavier. And to make it worse... From that Sunday, neighbors heard the family dogs howling, barking, and shrieking for about two nights in a row. And then, from Tuesday on, they never heard them again. In a strange turn of events, multiple witnesses reported seeing Agnes alive on Thursday, April 7th. Xavier was spotted making several trips between the house and his car, loading it with large bags, and Agnes assisting him. Another neighbor claimed to have seen Agnes walking around town that day. Quote, on April 7th, I saw Agnes walking in town. We had a brief discussion, but she had to cut it short. The newspapers reported that the autopsies placed her death on the 4th of April, but I saw her on the evening of Thursday the 7th, end quote. The same neighbor is quoted as saying, I recall having little time to talk with her because I had to pick up my son. Investigators later concluded that Zavi murdered his wife and three kids and their pet black Labradors over a few nights, beginning April 1st. The family's seemingly normal actions leading up to these tragic events only adds to the case's perplexing nature. What makes this even more twisted is that they were murdered one by one each night. After committing the murders, Xavier went to great lengths to avoid being caught. He embarked on a calculated series of actions to conceal his identity and avoid any capture. On April 7, 2011, he informed friends that the family was relocating to Australia due to a sudden job transfer. He also claimed that they were going to the U.S. to join a witness protection program. Xavier was seen on CCTV traveling through southern France, staying in hostels and withdrawing cash between April 11th and 15th, 2011. He was last seen on April 15th, 2011 at a hotel in France. This is where he abandoned his car and vanished. Agnès, Arthur, Thomas, Anne, and Benoit's bodies were all discovered buried beneath the terrace in the backyard of their family home on April 21st, 2011. The gruesome scene revealed that the family members were wrapped in sheets and plastic and covered in quicklime to hasten decomposition and mask any odors. The bodies had been meticulously buried, implying that the murders had been planned and carried out in detail. The crime scene did provide some key pieces of evidence. Several of these key pieces emerged as investigators searched the crime scene. The murder weapon was identified as a 22 caliber long rifle, like the one that Xavier inherited from his father. Sleeping pills were discovered in the victim's system, implying that they were drugged before being murdered. Despite extensive forensic analysis, no traces of DNA were discovered at the scene, and no evidence directly linked Xavier to his family's murders. Even after all these years, the disappearance of Xavier Dupont de Lugonese has triggered an international manhunt as investigators seek to learn the truth behind the heinous murders. Xavier has eluded capture despite numerous reported sightings, false leads, and even a high-profile arrest that later proved to be a case of mistaken identity. The investigation is still ongoing, and the whereabouts of Xavier remain unknown. The impact of this case on the Nantes community has been immense. The heinous murders and the subsequent investigations rightfully sent shockwaves through Nantes. Neighbors, friends, and family members were all left to deal with the brutal murders and the fact that Xavier, someone that they had known and trusted, was the prime suspect. 
Over a decade later, the community is still haunted by feelings of betrayal and disbelief as they try to comprehend how such a tragedy could have occurred in their midst. This case has certainly captivated people around the world. The bizarre circumstances, the murders, and the search for Xavier have inspired numerous news stories, documentaries, and even fictional adaptations of the case. While it's undoubtedly remained in the public eye, it's also resulted in the proliferation of conspiracy theories and sensationalized accounts, which can distract from the true focus of the case, the victims, the family, and finding Xavier. Investigators remain committed to uncovering the truth and bringing the perpetrator to justice. As I mentioned, this case has given rise to several theories about what could have driven Xavier to commit these terrible murders. One that's widely debated is that Zade's financial problems were the driving force behind his actions. It appeared that his life was in a downward spiral and his businesses failed and he had mounting debt. The family was on the verge of bankruptcy and they had lost their life savings. Aside from these general financial difficulties, it's been said that he was involved in illegal activities that contributed to the family's financial ruin. The theories just go on from there, from problems with Agnes to religious fanaticism and mental breakdowns. We may never truly know, and definitely not if we don't find Xavier. There's been numerous reported sightings of Xavier in various locations around the world in the years since the murders. Authorities received over 900 claims from people who believe that they saw Xavier. These sightings include dense forest areas in South America, as well as Germany, Scotland, and some religious monasteries. One investigation into a monastery was unsuccessful because the monks had taken a vow of silence, and thus, they refused to give any information to the police. A significant lead emerged in 2019 when a man resembling Xavier was captured on CCTV footage at a casino in Neri Labane, prompting authorities to focus their search efforts in that area. But once again, Xavier wasn't found. Again, we don't know if he's even alive at all. The persistence of law enforcement agencies and their search for Xavier is commendable, and they continue to follow leads and potential sightings in hope of finally apprehending him and shedding light on the motivations behind the murders. Until next time, be sure to follow us on our socials at The Murder Diaries Pod, and check out our Patreon for more Murder Diaries content. Until next time, stay safe. Bye. Seeking the truth never gets old. Introducing June's Journey, the free-to-play mobile game that will immerse you in a thrilling murder mystery. Join June Parker as she uncovers hidden objects and clues to solve her sister's death in a beautifully illustrated world set in the roaring 20s. With new chapters added every week, the excitement never ends. Download June's Journey now on your Android or iOS device or play on PC through Facebook games.